pleasure to be here and uh, my first time in uh, Mexico City. Uh, my apologies for not being able to give this talk in Spanish, uh, but uh, I know that my Spanish will be much worse than your English, so <laughs> I'm to um, I wanted to talk about the way in which phylogenies that are derived mostly from molecular uh, can illuminate molecular, can illuminate morphological evolution, um, also uh, behavioral and other uh, measurable characters. Um, and some of this is, will be very old work and some will be work of other people, but I wanted to cover several applications and talk about what some of the problems of the methods uh, that we have to use to take a phylogeny that someone else gives us from molecular data and then investigate the evolution of quantitative characters. And uh, there's been a lot of work, um, there's been lately a lot of more, a lot more integration of work on molecular evolution with work on quantitative characters and also with work on within-species variation of those characters, not just comparisons of widely different species. And so I wanted to, to try to uh, remind you of some of the uh, methods that people are using. And I'll do that by starting with uh, an old problem, uh, which was a problem that came up in the 1980s, um, and that was that people were studying the relationship between change of different characters in evolution by comparing different species. And the, the dominant way that they did this was to simply take, um, let's see if this works if I turn, um, one character, will, I'll call it brain weight, another character will call it body weight, collect data from a number of species, and did a regression line, fit a straight line to that data, to those data. And uh, now this is actually computer simulated data. That, that is my organism. That's the organism that I study. Um, is simulated evolution. Um, so it isn't real data. But uh, we fit the line. We find a significant slope of strong statistical evidence that in this imaginary organism, uh, brain weight is uh, correlated with body weight and changes among different species. Um, and the problem with that is, of course, that this regression, the assumptions you make in the statistical test, is that you have independent data points, These, there are 16 of them here, um, and that those are independent, identically distributed, drawn from some distribution. That's the common assumption uh, in regression analysis. And if you use it this way, you're making the assumption that all of those points evolved completely independently of each other. But, of course, they didn't. Uh, in the simulation, we had a phylogeny. Uh, this is the actual phylogeny of those 16 species, uh, somewhat arbitrarily uh, constructed. You could imagine that we are given this phylogeny by molecular data and it, it is somehow estimated accurately. Um, and then, in this case, we did computer simulations of two characters on this phylogeny. Now, in fact, I know because this is simulated data, I have godlike powers and I can know the truth, which is that the two characters that I'm calling brain weight and body weight are completely independent, that there was no, there was no covariation, no correlation in their evolution. So, what do we do? Well, we have to take account of the fact that, for example, E and F, those species are very closely related, they will be very similar in phenotype, those are not independent points. We can't just try to figure out how many independent points there are because every pair that you take is covaries. I mean, all of these share some evolution, the evolution 
that occurred on this line. All of these share the evolution that occurred on this line. Uh, now, the cor one of the correct ways to do a phylogenetic comparative method, uh, which was developed by me in the 1980s, mid-1980s, is to compute contrasts among species. There are other ways. There's a method called phylogenetic, um, the phylogenetic regression uh, by Alan Graffin that is essentially equivalent to contrast, but it's a different computation. Um, and what those involve is comparing the differences between A and B and standardizing it by the, um, the total branch length from A to B, uh, dividing the difference by the square root of that. Because we're going to make an assumption that the, the evolution here was random wandering on a scale by Brownian motion. And you look at the difference between A and B, and another contrast the difference between C and D, and so on. And differences at higher levels between an average of A and D and an average of C and D. Um, and there is a scheme of weighting by branch lengths, which is built into this method that I'm not going to cover. This is very old, old work. Um, and in the end, you get 15 different contrasts, each appropriately standardized, and you can plot those against each other. The expected di difference here is zero, because in advance, when we're here and we're simulating evolution, we don't know whether C will be to the right on the scale of D, or C will be to the left of D. Um, either one is equally possible, so the expected contrast is zero. So, if we take those appropriately standardized contrasts from this data set and we plot them, here they are. Now this is the contrast of brain weight against the contrast, sorry, contrast of brain weight against the contrast of body weight. And the result is, at first it looks like a positive relationship, but when you do the statistical test, you find that the slope, it has a positive slope, but the uh, p-value is now not significant. Um, and that, the reason if you stare at it is these central points here uh, don't show very much regression. Only these two outliers are really contributing most of the slope. And the statistical test correctly uh, detects that. So using the phylogeny, we can um, we can make a correction for the fact that species are not independently derived. And in fact, the whole point of a phylogeny is that the species are not independently derived. It's a diagram showing you how much, um, we have, how much two species co-vary in their evolution. So I look much more similar to a chimpanzee than I do to a um, a jellyfish, um, and that is reflected in the phylogeny. That diagram tells me to expect that. Okay. So this is the simple contrast method, and it's the first thing you have to do when you to make use of phylogenies uh, in investigating the evolution of uh, measurable characters. Uh, and I should say that when I was in graduate school in Chicago in the 1950s, uh, 1960s, I'm sorry, not that old, uh, almost that old, uh, in the 1960s, um, I was studying theoretical population genetics, and we had wonderful equations uh, for the change of gene frequencies. We had the Kolmogorov diffusion equations that Sewell Wright had used and Kimura was using. We had all this beautiful technology for gene frequencies. But in that era, we didn't know how to think about differences between species. There were systematists who worked on that who did not have much in the way of, uh, of mathematical theory. And people were just beginning to do molecular phylogenies. The mid-1960s was an incredibly fertile period for the earliest studies uh, using uh, protein sequences and the development of all the numerical methods for inferring phylogenies. Uh, a lot of that occurred in the 1960s. But I remember feeling that there must be some way of thinking about differences between species, and what was it? What was it? 
and I, uh, I got interested in met numerical methods and then statistical methods for inferring phylogenies. And it was a long time before I finally realized that that was the key, that was the secret. That the interpretation of um, differences between species in all sorts of characters could only happen really if you had a phylogeny. It was with reference to the phylogeny that, that you could make sensible statements about that. Otherwise, you would, you would make uh, silly statements. Okay. So, we have to think about uh, the mathematical models that underlie uh, this kind of inference. And where they start, really, is to start way back in 1918, almost 100 years ago, uh, with the model that R.A. Fisher developed of quantitative genetics, and, um, and then adapt that to phylogenies. So here's Fisher's model. Uh, we imagine a quantitative character. In practice, we don't know uh, what genes are involved. Uh, we haven't, let's say we haven't done elaborate QTL studies. Uh, we don't know what genes are involved. We don't know what alleles are present at those genes. We don't know what their gene frequencies are. But what Fisher did was to imagine that we knew this. Just a second here. Uh, this, this thing, I, I did recharge the batteries just for a second. Did you, um, you said there was a, is, is it going to be trouble for you to find a, another pointer? Uh, because I cannot speak unless I can gesture at a screen. I, I cannot just stand here and speak. Some which? I don't know. I've never been to Cuba, by the way. Uh, anyway, uh, I will still try with this one. Okay, so, so what Fisher said is let us make a simple model, a simple model which has become the standard model of quantitative genetics. And um, let us uh, imagine that this character starts with a number, that the, the value of the character in a particular individual. Um, yeah, that's better. Um, starts with an arbitrary starting point, and then each gene adds something to the character depending on the genotype. So here is a scheme for this gene: uh, a little a, little a adds seven; uh, heterozygote adds four; big A, big A adds two. Uh, and you imagine that you somehow know this scheme. Of course, in reality, you don't. And then, for any genotype, for example, this genotype here, you can read off the numbers and say we start with the starting point, which will, uh, uh, I forget what we're taking it as, uh, and uh, add 2 and add 0.1 and add 6 and add 0.7 and add 0.3, and then you add an independent environmental effect. The simple model makes the assumption that the environmental effect is independent, which of course is not really true. Uh, and independent in different individuals, which is not really true either. Um, and you, do, you draw from a distribution such as a normal distribution with a known variance. Uh, you draw an effect and it gets added on. So we might have this sum uh, as the phenotype of that individual. And then if you had this scheme, you could imagine yourself uh, drawings phenotypes for any individual based on its genotype. Now what Ari Fisher did with that was to use it to create rules for what covariances were between relatives as a function of variance components where you have the additive genetic variance, the dominance variance, and the environmental variance. And by connecting the covariances of relatives to those quantitative genetic variance components, you get the magical effect that um, you can make rules relating the covariances of relatives to each other. You can use those to estimate the variance components. You can use those to predict response to simple kinds of artificial and natural selection um, without knowing exactly how many genes are involved and without knowing exactly um, what those, what those numbers in the table are. So uh, that was Fisher's machinery for developing modern quantitative genetics. 
1918. Um, now, if you have a character whose determination works this way, what will happen as it evolves along a lineage in a phylogeny? What we're going to do is assume that what happens is two things. One is that the gene frequencies of these loci will wander by genetic drift, by random genetic drift. And if you do that, you will find out that each gene frequency is approximated by Brownian motion. Let me see, do I have, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I don't have, uh, yeah. You can approximate the change of each gene frequency by saying, well, it's similar to a Brownian motion. It isn't quite because at the end of the scale, I have a gene frequency of zero or a gene frequency of one, uh, the Brownian motion stops. I mean, Brownian motion in general, the mathematical thing, Brownian motion, uh, does not stop. So, but it's, it's approximated by it. And if each locus is independently wandering, very close approximation, independently wandering by genetic drift, then the result will be that the character as a whole will wander also by a, a, a genetic drift. And here we have a simple phylogeny, it's hard to see, of five tips, five species. And we simulated the wanderings by, uh, of a character by brown motion of, on this lineage and on this lineage. Here is an interior node that splits. They keep crossing each other. Here's another split, another split. You finally end up getting these. And you have a distribution of, of the values you will see at the tips. It's very noisy, but it has, co it has covariances and correlations uh, that, are, uh, that are determined by the shape of the phylogeny. So if someone gives you a molecular phylogeny, you, and if, if you are willing to make the assumption that the um, morphological character is changing by genetic drift, you can make some predictions about the joint distribution of that character on the tips of the tree. Um, and uh, this um, approximation of gene frequencies by Brownian motion was done in, in the 1960s by Anthony Edwards and Luca Cavalli Sforza. Uh, and I was the one who happened to mention first that one could apply this to uh, quantitative characters. Uh, and the person who has done the most to develop quanti modern quantitative genetics uh, as a tool for natural populations has been this guy, uh, Russell Landy, Russ Landy, who uh, is currently at Imperial College in Britain. He's an American, but he's at Imperial College in Britain. Um, and um, now he's moving to Norway, however, so uh, I don't know the exact uh, institute. Uh, but anyway, in the 1980s, what Russ, do, Russ Landy did was to uh, come up with useful uh, expressions for quantitative genetic formulas uh, that would be useful in natural populations. And he really was a, uh, did major work then that's been incredibly important. Um, now, I've said, okay, let's imagine that the, the change is all due to genetic drift. And of course, the change is not all due to genetic drift. Um, there's migration, and there's genetic drift, and there's mutation, but an important factor here is natural selection. When you're dealing with a, a visible um, morphological character, generally it's, it's not very sensible to assume that natural selection cannot see that character. Uh, so you're going to be having genetic drift, but you're also going to be having changes due to natural selection for which it's less easy to make a simple model. Um, if you see in evolution that two traits co-vary, so we see that brain weight and body weight change uh, in a correlated way, um, what does that do to? A lot of people will look and say it's due to genetic covariances, genetic correlations. Some of the same loci that affect brain weight are also affecting body weight, for example, size genes. Um, and um, so you would expect covariation due to the genetics, the common genetics, but that's not the whole story. There's another major factor that a lot of people don't think about. 
when you raise this issue, they're very quick to say quantitative genetics, uh, genetic covariation is the cause of this correlation. But there's another thing called selective covariance or selective correlation. And that was actually first introduced by a Swedish plant breeder, Olaf Kadid, in 1926. And it was emphasized by uh, Ledyard Stebbins in his famous book, uh, Variation uh, and, it, and Evolution in Higher Plants, uh, in 1950. Uh, variation and Evolution in Plants, I believe, one of the most famous books in plant uh, evolutionary biology. And he pointed out his use of this term, selective covariance. What that is, is that environmental conditions can select for changes in two characters in the same direction, even though those characters are not genetically correlated. So, for example, uh, if we have, let me see, did I know that it, that's not it? That's me. Um, if we imagine a lineage that has become, uh, that is of mammals, that has moved into the Arctic, um, and it is in that lineage, natural selection is favoring a larger body weight, a darker coloration, and relatively shorter limbs. That's, those are three rules called uh, Bergman's rule, Allen's rule, and Globler's rule. And they really are talking about natural selection under the same conditions favoring changes in two characters, even if those characters have no genetic correlation whatsoever. So you have to think about both genetic covariances and selective covariances. Uh, they are both sources of the covariation as the characters wander in that phylogeny. In the case of the selective covariances, um, the characters may be trying to climb an adaptive peak. I don't have a graph here showing this. Uh, they may be trying to reach an, a, a, a selective optimum, an, uh, an, uh, an optimum selection, an optimum phenotype. But that optimum phenotype may itself move as a result of environmental changes, interactions with other organisms, um, etc. So there's two sources of this covariation. Um, and I want to show you a, a few uh, projects uh, showing treatment of different kinds of data. Um, one of them will be on morphometrics, on me measurements of actual uh, geometric form of organisms. Uh, the work I'm doing on that is together with Fred Bookstein, who is a very famous guy working in morphometrics. Fred is now at my university, at the University of Washington, and he and I have been working on a project together, and we figure we have a common ancestor. Uh, and, um, even though he pronounces his name Steen and I pronounce my name Stein, um, we do have a common ancestor with mutation somewhere. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the two of these two pictures carefully superimposed. Uh, if you ask me afterwards, I can tell you how to do that <laughs> imaging software. It's actually very easy. So that's JFL Bookenstein. Uh, and that's who did this project. Now, you can take a form. You can take, for example, a two-dimensional uh, image of a fish and define landmarks, the, the point of a fin or uh, the placement of the, the front of the nose. Uh, and you can have a, a group of, of landmarks that you measure. You can get x, y coordinates of those. And somebody could come along and say, well, uh, let's, uh, let's just consider those to be quantitative characters. Why don't we just take those to be quantitative characters and assume that at least in the short term, uh, a Brownian, a correlated Brownian motion, correlated because of uh, so of genetic covariances and selective covariances uh, applies to that. There's a problem if you do that. And the problem is that when the person digitized the fish, when they collected those XY coordinates, they take the fish or an image of the fish and they place it on a surface and they collect the, the XY coordinates. But where exactly they place the fish, the, tr the, the translation of the fish, uh, is their decision. It's not a decision of the fish. Uh, also, how the fish is rotated is also, again, their decision. 
And we don't want to do modeling of the mental state of biologists, that's <laughs> not very good. Um, so how do we correct for the translation and rotation of the fish? Well, there's a whole machinery for that called the morphometric consensus that Fred helped develop. But he and I have lately uh, been working on a revision of that. Uh, let me just point out the, uh, the, the, the problem with the uh, superposition of the uh, of the fishes, of, of the horizontal treatment. Here is, a, here is a fish with landmarks. Here is the same fish. Now let's imagine evolution occurring in this lineage so that at the end, well, these four landmarks move backwards by one centimeter. Okay. That's an evolutionary change. Here's another evolutionary lineage. In this case, what happened is the front of nine Let's see how many nine landmarks move forward. I forgot to draw the arrows here. Um, but there are nine landmarks. They move forward one centimeter. Question, is this different evolutionary change in those lineages? Does anybody have a, a guess? No. You say no. You say no just because, having presented it dramatically that way, the answer has to be no. Uh, no, but what, was it, what is the reason? What reason do you give? Because it's exactly the same, isn't it? It's just uh, increasing the length. The length. Yeah, increase the length by one. The, 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 in this region, the length increased by one centimeter. And in fact, these two fish here are exactly the same. And I know it's exactly the same because I drew this picture. <laughs> <laughs> I simply picked up this fish in my drawing program and moved it over down differently and it becomes that fish. So it's just a matter of where I superpose the fish. Uh, and the superposition is to some extent arbitrary. So we have to use our coordinates in a way that recognizes this. I think we, yeah, the answer is no. Um, and so we have, uh, we first of all use uh, not the horizontal coordinates, but the differences between them, what's called the helmet, there's a Helmer coordinates, which is basically just saying we're using only the differences between, and we're, we're removing from the data set the, 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 the exact position of the fish. In fact, what we do is center the centroids of the fishes, the average position, the average of all x's is, is kept at zero, the average of all y's is also kept at zero. Um, and that removes this problem by dropping two coordinates, and X, one X coordinate and one Y coordinate. So whereas we had 13 times two uh, coordinates here before, now afterwards we have uh, 12 times two, uh, we, because we've superposed the centroids of the fishes. Okay, this is just saying that, I'm gonna skip on. But there's the problem of rotation. What do you do about rotation? And that turns out to be harder, there is not as easy a simple transformation that gets rid of rotation. What we are going to do in our project is we're going to have a correlated Brownian motion model of the change in those characters, um, and we're going to infer the rotations of the individual fish as if they were parameters. This is not a perfect method. Uh, you can criticize this one for estimating too many parameters. Um, but infer them by using the final maximum likelihood value, by using the final likelihood value uh, for any other parameters that we choose. So we're, we're fitting some other parameters, uh, they give us a likelihood value, uh, and we rotate the fish until we get the highest possible value. All the fish get rotated until uh, they, we get the highest possible value of the, of the overall likelihood in the study. So those are, the, those are the methods we use for simple morphometrics. I will add as a footnote for people who are familiar already with morphometrics that we actually don't use the morphometric consensus machinery. Um, even though Fred helped develop it, we are both now critical of it and say maybe we should more directly analyze the uh, coordinates after removing uh, rotation and translation, but not uh, doing the entire morphometric machinery. Let me show you a, a simple simulation. Uh, once again, simulated data. This is an imaginary fish 
called the Thresher Salmon Shark Alopia uh, corincus. Uh, uh, and uh, what we do is we start from this fish. It has 10 landmarks. Uh, it has coordinates of those landmarks. I'm going to have a phylogeny, which we simulate by a pure birth process of splitting lineages. We get the phylogeny. Then we evolve the fish up the phylogeny. And we allow each landmark to wander horizontally and vertically in a little Brownian motion of its own. But we also put some co some co-varying Brownian motion in there as a result of either genetic processes or correlated selection. One will be to have the top of the fin go up and the top of this fin go out at a 45 degree angle in a perfectly correlated way. The second will be to have the nose, the three coordinate, the x coordinates of the nose, go forward in a perfectly, in an independent, perfectly correlated way. And there is also a, the size is also changing, and we're having the nose, in this particular simulation, the nose movements are correlated with size. I won't go over the, you know, these are the parameters, but um, I'll just show you the result. The result is, here are some fish, okay. Here are some of the fish. Uh, we simulated 100 fish of this phylogeny. Um, and they change in size quite a lot. And their fins move around and their noses move around. Um, and this is just 20 of them plotted because I couldn't plot them all because it, it wouldn't be easy to see. Well, adjusting, taking care of the translations and the rotations, also doing an adjustment for size, which is a complex issue that I'm not going to go into, you can end up with the fishes resized and translated and rotated. So this is a particular superposition where we've kept the average of the, the centroid, the average of x's and the average of y's, exactly at zero, zero. And there are the fish. And now, we, we say, okay, these are covariant characters, let's use the contrast method on the true phylogeny. We imagine that uh, lots of molecular study has been done and has recovered the true phylogeny. Now let's use the contrast method and try to estimate the covariances between these different parts of the fish. Um, so we do that and we get a covariance matrix estimated and that we can get principal components of, and we look at the first principal component just to see the biggest effect, and there it is. Um, we get a lot of movement here. It looks like it's in approximately the right direction. Some movements uh, in other areas. Some of that is because of interaction between these due to the centroid. Uh, we can adjust this. this. This is a technical matter that I don't want to spend the time on. We can adjust this by taking the first principal component and adding a little location movement in to make, to make the uh, coefficients be as, um, uh, to make the small coefficients as small as possible, basically. And what we get is this. So it's the same thing plotted in a different way that decreases the sizes of these movements and now shows a very clear signal for one of our major movements, which is the fins going up and down and out in, in the correct way. So we're correctly recovering. Uh, because it's a simulated process where I know all, I know exactly how evolution happened, I can say that yes, that is a correct inference. So there are some problems with morphometrics, issues of uh, translation, rotation, and issue of how you treat size. But we can put it into this framework of um, a framework of quantitative genetics with an assumption that a process, the process ends up looking like Brownian motion as a result of drift and selection. Uh, the, by the way, if I did the operations of the morphometric consensus, which do not, in its original form, do not use the phylogeny, I get a signal for the first principal components, and some of the correct things are happening here, but it's much less clear. Uh, part mainly, mainly because uh, it is not taking the phylogeny into account. Just like that first regression I showed you, it's getting the wrong signal because it forgot that the points are not independent. Okay. 
Um, the second project that I want to show you is one on fossils, using fossils, uh, with using morphological data from fossils in conjunction with molecular data from living species. Um, this is something that I developed, but also independently, Liam Rebell of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, developed the same method that he published it and I haven't. So uh, we have to, uh, I'm happy to give Liam, who's a very good guy, credit. This is, he's a, a lizard, um, he works on anoles, uh, very huge numbers of brilliant phylogenetic comparative method people, and they all work on anoles for some reason. Um, so here it is in Puerto Rico uh, with a giant anole. Uh, this is a shot from his website. Uh, okay, what Liam did and what I also did uh, was to try to ask the question of how if we have fossils, if we observe morphology from fossils, can we hook it up to a molecular phylogeny? There is an existing method, uh, which is, there's some nice statistical work been done by Alexander Pyrrhon and by Frederick Gronquist using, both using Bayesian methods. Um, for discrete characters in which you take a phylogeny and then you, you ask about the origins of these discrete characters. I'm not going to describe it because I'm going to give a very different framework that, that Liam and I have used. And the, the basic inference that we're doing here is to take molecular sequences, morphology from, from present-day species, morphology from fossil species, where the molecular sequences are only from the present day species. We're not getting into ancient DNA here. Uh, mostly we'll be dealing with organisms that are too old for that. So you can infer a tree from the, the neontology, from the present day molecular data. You can then take the morphology and ask how it changes on that tree for the present day species, the, the neontology. And that's machinery like phylogenetic comparative methods, the machinery like the contrast method. And you can infer how these morphological characters co-vary as they change along the phylogeny. But what about fossils? What can you do there? Well, I suggest that the correct way of thinking about that is to <coughs> assume that these same covariances apply to the morphological characters. And use that then to place the fossils in the tree, to, to find out where they connect to the tree by doing it statistically in a way that's consistent among what the molecular sequences tell us about the phylogeny, what those tell us about the covariation of characters, uh, and putting it all together so that we can make uh, an estimate of the tree, including both the present day and fossil species. Now, it sounds easy. Um, here is, first of all, uh, uh, showing you how easy it is, and then later I'll show you that it's not quite so easy. Um, here we have, uh, I'm imagining, uh, four species, two fossil species that have occurred at a known time. We know that they're 10 million years ago, for example. Um, I'm imagining, suppose we think these are closest relatives, but they have to hook into the tree somewhere. So we hook them in at a place and we calculate for the, we calculate from using, say, the contrast method, what the likelihood would be of that whole tree, including the fossil and the, uh, uh, the, the fossil species and the present day species. And we get about it. And then we try other connections for this point here. So there it goes. We try them. As we reconnect and re-estimate Re recompute the likelihood, we get there's a likelihood plot here uh, that it changes. And finally, it's telling us that this seems to be the best supported connection for those species. And it gives us an idea of how much noise there is in that input. So here is the best supported point in this somewhat imaginary case. So you can look and say, okay, we can do that. We take our molecular tree, we take our fossils, and we know how many million years ago the fossils were, we just put it in. Uh, this is just a statement of, uh, what, of all of what I just told you, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to uh, spend time on that. Here is a numerical uh, simulation in which I took, I evolved species by gravity and motion, 
I took one of them and I made it a fossil. I evolve them all, and then later we connect. We, we take the tree, the true tree, for all of these, and we try connecting the fossil in different places on the tree. And here the colors, the traffic light colors, are green for the areas that are within one unit of log likelihood, uh, orange for within two units of log likelihood, and red if it's more than that. And that seems to be pushing us to connect it in this region of the tree. Now you look at that and it looks very simple, but I, there's one way in which I'm misleading you. There's one way in which I'm, um, I'm, I'm assuming something that we can't really assume. And that is, um, I'm assuming that there's not only a molecular clock for the molecular data, and a morphological clock for the morphology. Both of those are possibly uh, dubious assumptions. <coughs> but we're assuming we can get them onto a common scale of time. And we can not only infer a clock-like morphological tree, but know not just how many units of branch length of that you go back to an ancestor, but how, many, how much time. So there is the issue of how did you get that calibration of the clock? How did you get the time scale in this? Well, if we stretch the molecular tree, try different time scalings of the molecular tree, we have to keep the fossils at the same time. This is now on a time scale. And as we do that, if you look closely at this one and that one, you'll see they aren't quite proportional to each other because the fossils have stayed in the same place. They haven't moved proportionately downwards. So there is information there by look, comparing the likelihoods for the morphology in the Brownian motion model. Um, there is information there about scale of the tree. And what we're seeing is a, a rather idealized, but nevertheless possibly usable framework for uh, using morphological change to calibrate molecular, uh, the, the time scale of, from molecular data. This is, it is that same inference. And, yeah. okay. um, so there, you have to do this, and this is an issue, and yes, all those uh, clock assumptions are also an issue. So uh, here, let's see, um, this is some sort of numerical example, but I can't remember what it is. Um, it's, the, it's connecting, it's basically connecting the, this thing to the tree and rescaling the, uh, the tree appropriately. Uh, let me skip on since I can't remember the details of that one. Uh, so we take the molecular tree as known. Now that's assuming a lot. That's assuming we have molecular phylogeny people who are perfect and give us nothing but perfect trees. That's not, of course, true. Um, we could use not a single tree from the molecular people, but um, multiple trees, either from a Bayesian inference where you get them as posterior samples from the posterior distribution of trees, or you could use bootstrap methods, which of course I was involved in developing, so I like them. Uh, but either one could be used. And you could then say to yourself, let's do the analysis on each of these. With modern computers, you can do it. Um, and let's look at the, at the noise that comes in, not only from the randomness of Brownian motion, but also from our uncertainty about the trees as expressed in that. Um, and uh, Pyron and Ronquist have also uh, tried to integrate the, in a Bayesian framework, the, mo the morphology and the molecular in their discrete characters uh, machinery uh, to do a comparable thing. Um, so um, it would be possible to use the morphology to help infer the tree. But actually, in modern data sets, that's not a very big effect. We have so much molecular data that it is kind of overwhelms any inference we could make about the tree from the morphology. What we want to do with the morphology is to infer what the morphology is doing. Then, then morphology is extremely relevant. Uh, OK. Um, now, my third example I will give is, is to just add one more note to this and say, 
in addition to you fossil, using fossil machinery, using more metric machinery, uh, and, and doing these inferences, there is the issue of do we have a model, what about zero, one characters? Before I was talking about Brownian motion, the characters are on a scale, they're measurements of some sort, they could be morphology, they could be behavior, they could be physiology, uh, many things. But there's also the issue of what happens when you see a character like this, uh, a, a ridge on the scale of a lizard, and the ridge, you find that the ridge is either there or it's not there. There are two states, zero and one. Well, if you have such a character, how do you, can you in some way use it in this model machine? Um, this is missing from a, a paper I published in 2012, so uh, uh, I'll talk about that. There is some machinery out there. People like Mark Pagel and Paul Lewis said, let us model discrete characters that are not, they're not nucleotides, they're discrete zero, one characters. Let's model them as if they were nucleotides, where there's random change back and forth between two states. Uh, and they have a whole machinery for looking at, um, for inferring phylogenies and for looking at correlation, correlated evolution among characters. And it's fine, but I have some problems with the uh, biological realism of that problem. Uh, they don't take into account um, what's going on at the genetic level underlying this. Um, and also, Lewis's machinery does not allow us to uh, look at, assume that evolution in different characters is covariant. So I, I, what I've done is to go back to an earlier model of threshold characters by this guy, Sewell Wright, who of course you are all familiar with. Uh, if you aren't familiar with him, leave the room and go green. <laughs> okay, Sewell Wright, the great uh, founder, along with R.A. Fisher and J.B.S. Haldane of theoretical population genetics, towering figure in the, uh, uh, in the uh, development of theoretical population genetics, which led on to the development of the modern evolutionary synthesis. Uh, here he is photographed in 1954. At the time he was in, uh, appointed, to the, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, so he posed with his organism. He did most of the genetics that's ever been done on him. Um, on guinea pigs, he trained many mammalian geneticists. Um, and here are some of the uh, uh, Kolmogorov equations that he adapted to use on diffusion processes, which he played a huge role in developing starting in the, uh, around 1930. There is a rumor that immediately after this photo was taken, he turned and erased the board with the guinea pig. <laughs> Uh, Sewell Wright was a, uh, an absent-minded professor. By the way, I knew him, many of us knew him because he lived until 1988, uh, almost 100 years, and he was a, a, an absolute model of an absent-minded professor, and he was the world's worst lecturer. He would go to the blackboard and mumble while writing equations with his back to the audience, and the audience wouldn't understand anything he said. Um, he furiously denied that he had erased the board with the guinea pig. But many people who had taken courses from him had seen him bring guinea pigs into the lecture room to show their colors to the students. If you've worked with mammals, uh, I once worked as a technician with uh, rabbits, and uh, one of the ways you calm them down is you, if they start wandering and you don't want them to wander, you're giving a lecture, you take them, you put them under your arm and you cover both eyes with your arm and your body and the guinea pig says, aha, uh, I'm in a hole, I'm happy, and it comes down. Um, Sewell Wright apparently also used to put erasers under his arm when he worked at the board. Many students said that they had seen it happen, that he, got, uh, that he forgot himself and erased the board. <laughs> Now, Sewell Wright, here is, by the way, Sewell Wright shown at the University of Chicago, where he was for 30 years. In 1928, he worked on the threshold character that I'm going to talk about. He's from 1934. Um, here he is posing at the university in a particular place. I know this building because in this building over here is where I did my PhD. 
uh, the, the zoology building. Here it is in 2013, uh, the steps have become a ramp. And this beautiful antique lamp wasn't there when Sue O'Reilly was photographed. It is more recently added to make the campus look more picturesque. <laughs> okay, what did Sue O'Reilly do? He was working on the genetics of any pig. A digit number, how many toes they had on the hind feet, either three or four, uh, oversimplified a little bit, he assumed that there's a quantitative character on a scale that we can't see called viability. And then a, a developmental process turns that into either three toes or four toes. So you're assuming something like Brownian motion going on, a quantitative character here. He used it for crosses of different uh, for crosses of different lines of guinea pigs. Now let's adapt it to phylogenies. You can say that there is a quantitative character, it's undergoing Brownian motion uh, with co-variation with other traits. Uh, and the proportion of three-toed versus four-toed guinea pigs you get. Uh, we place a threshold at an arbitrary point on this ar un unobservable scale, uh, and we will see the proportion of, z of one states instead of zero states changing, and here it is simulated along a tree uh, with the mean liability values here, uh, and the proportions of ones and zeros there. And you get a very realistic looking process. Uh, and it has some nice properties. At any moment, it not only makes a prediction about what the mean is doing, but it predicts what the variation in the population of this threshold trait will, will be. Uh, it also has the property that as the evolutionary process passes the threshold and the, pop, and the species changes from state zero to state one, there is not only some polymorphism, but it can readily change back the other direction, but if you wait longer, it will wander far from the threshold and it won't be so easy to change back. That seems to me to be more biologically realistic. Let me try to finish off quickly here. Um, you can imagine computing likelihoods with this. It is hard. You have to add up, you have to integrate in areas of uh, Areas of a multivariate normal distribution, you have to sort of chop off the part that corresponds to the, the phenotypes that you see. And uh, there are integrals for what the likelihood looks like. And it looks like it's going to be a mess, but there's a way out of it. And the way out to, to just skip ahead is we can imagine that we know the liabilities at the tips and then reconstruct them in the interior of the tree. We don't really know those. But then we can use Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, similar to what you do in inference of phylogenies. But this is with a known phylogeny and we can vary the placement on the liability scale of, the, of all the nodes in the tree. Here is the threshold at zero. And let me just step forwards in a simulation. Uh, this is done. Uh, showing the results of the simulation. And you'll see the tips are being allowed to move around, but they have to stay on the correct side of the threshold to fit the phenotypes that you observe. And the interior nodes move around. And as you do that, you can collect information on the covariances of characters, the covariance of this character with other characters that are doing that, and estimate the covariance matrix. And what I've done is some simulations on the tree, a hundred species arbitrary tree. Uh, here, are, here is the uh, red and white codes showing the zero and one states for three characters. Here we did a simulation with three characters. The first two, they change at different rates. The first two are positively correlated in their evolutionary change. The last two negatively correlated, the first and third zero covariance. And if we do all this Markov chain Monte Carlo machinery and then estimate, in this case, not the covariances, but the, for technical reasons, the correlations, we see that in 100 simulations, we get approximately the right answer. The correlation is supposed to be this value, and in fact comes out widely varied. 
It's supposed to be zero, it varies around that. It's supposed to be negative between characters two and three, uh, it varies a lot. So two things are visible. One is, yes, the method is recurring, recovering the correct underlying genetic covariation of the underlying covariation of change, both genetic and selective. Approximately correctly, but the second thing we see is it's only approximate because it's a limited amount of data. You're estimating a covariance from only 100 tips, <coughs> and you're not even seeing the, the character, the numerical characters, you're seeing only the zeros and ones. If you go to a statistician and say, I want to estimate the covariance, they will say, how many hundreds of samples do you have? And you say, well, only 100. And just, they'll also say when they find out that you're thresholding the values, they'll basically throw you out of their office and refuse to talk to you. Uh, and, there is a, and that's what we see. It's a very noisy inference. So yes, you can do it, but there are limits to what you can infer this way. However, I think it's a useful way of dealing with 0, 1 characters in the same kind of framework. QTLs may get involved in this in the future. It's really interesting to think about ways we could integrate doing QTL inference in difference in multiple species into this framework. I don't know of any case, no one has done it, but uh, I think, I think it, it will be possible to get some very interesting information there. Um, so all of this then is part of a great reunion of different levels of work that's occurred. It's not a new evolutionary synthesis. It's using the same modern synthesis that's now not so modern. It's from the 1930s and 40s uh, as amended by molecular data. Uh, but Russ Landy's vision that we can look at quantitative character models and, and productively infer things about evolutionary processes is, I think, being vindicated. So we're seeing unification of work at all these levels. Um, and I want to emphasize it's not a change in our, in our view of what processes are happening in evolution. It's not a new synthesis. But um, it is a reunion where people who are not talking to each other are now getting together to have uh, joint picnics and um, uh, exchange information. And I think we're, we're headed into a very interesting period. But we have to keep in mind that all this is limited by these idealized models. Uh, and if you start looking at large numbers of species which are morphologically, uh, molecularly very different, those models will break down. You cannot take this model and look at all higher plants, for example. They're just too different from each other. Uh, in addition, um, the, you cannot get, the first point here, is you cannot necessarily get an exact account of what was happening in evolution. You saw that in the threshold model. Uh, the inferences are very noisy. The popular science press wants an exact account they want to know that in the year, uh, that 75 million years ago, this Tyrannosaurus rex number 238 ate Tyrannosaurus rex number 327. Uh, they want a detailed account of everything that happened in evolution. They get very excited at that prospect. We are going to have to face the issue that some of those things are beyond their ability to know. Uh, and try to convey to people what we can and cannot infer. Okay, so I want to thank um, for past support the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences at the NIH, uh, and increasingly the Felsenstein Red Family funds. Uh, you notice our motto here: instead of painting the kitchen. Uh, and, of course, for this talk, uh, the Collegio Nacional and the UNAM uh, for inviting me here. I have references on the uh, on this, and I'll try to uh, make this available to make this projection PDF available to people. Thank you.